The man known to history as Pharaoh Akhenaten was born at some unknown date and year, though almost certainly in the 1360s BC. He was certainly alive in 1361 BC, but most likely many years prior to this, with 1368 BC or 1367 BC being plausible candidates for the year of his birth. His father was the pharaoh or king of Egypt, Amenhotep III. Akhenaten was named after his father when he was born, and while he is known to history as Akhenaten, for much of his life he was called Amenhotep. Akhenaten, as we will see, was a name he took himself later in his life. Amenhotep III had been on the throne for around two decades by the time Akhenaten was born, having come to be pharaoh in the early 1380s BC. It is not known where Akhenaten was born. Some Egyptologists have speculated that he may have been born and raised in the ancient city of Memphis near Heliopolis, a city which had a strong cult of worshipping the sun god Ra. Others contend that he was born around the city of Thebes, the more southerly capital of the Egyptian kingdom in the 14th century BC, approximate to modern-day Luxor. There, a major royal palace had been constructed at Malkata by his father, and it would probably make most sense for him to have been born there. Akhenaten's mother was Tia, the great wife of Amenhotep. Egyptian rulers practiced polygamy and had numerous wives, some often being close relatives or even sisters. Amongst these multiple consorts, there was typically a great wife, and the pharaoh's successor would normally be chosen from amongst the sons born to this chief consort. This placed Akhenaten in line to the throne, but he had an older brother who was also born to Tia, Prince Tatmosa. Beyond these, Akhenaten had a very large number of siblings and half-siblings, owing to the polygamous nature of the royal court. The boy that would become Akhenaten one day was born into a part of the world which already had a very long history by the 14th century BC. Egypt had emerged as far back as the 4th millennium BC as one of the first major centers of Neolithic and Chalcolithic settled civilizations as people began farming in great numbers along the shores of the River Nile. In ancient times, and indeed prior to the building of the Aswan Dam in the 20th century, the Nile flooded every year. This annual inundation deposited rich alluvial soil onto the banks of the river several hundred meters inland, allowing people here to survive out of the agricultural products grown on these floodplains in an otherwise arid desert environment. Based on this, an advanced culture with a writing system, industry and other economic elements emerged and by the middle of the 3rd millennium BC, the pharaohs or kings of the Old Kingdom were in a position to deploy resources capable of building the Great Pyramid on the Giza Plateau, next to modern-day Cairo. Unsurprisingly, a complex religious system also developed, one which lionized deities like Osiris, the god of the River Nile, on which the people were so reliant for their subsistence, and Ra, the sun god who was so central to the lives of people who otherwise lived in the midst of the Sahara Desert. This pharaonic society had peaked early in the middle of the 3rd millennium BC as the rulers of what is termed the Old Kingdom built the greatest of the pyramids. Thereafter, it went through peaks and valleys. For instance, the 22nd and 21st centuries BC were turbulent ones of unrest in Egypt but thereafter the Middle Kingdom was a new period of growth. A fresh bout of chaos came in the 17th century BC, when a people called the Hyksos descended from the Levant into northern Egypt, conquered the Nile Delta and much of the north of the country from the Egyptian kings. For a period of a century and a half, Egypt was divided and harassed by the Hyksos. Yet they too were conquered over time and in the 15th century BC, Akhenaten's great-great-grandfather, Tatmosa III, had overseen Egypt's rise to a position of unprecedented national power and wealth. Ruling for over a half a century, he reunified Egypt fully, extended its power further down the Nile into what we now call Sudan, and also conquered much of the Levant into regions approximating today with Palestine, Israel, 
and even towards Jordan and into parts of Syria and Lebanon. Trade flourished across the eastern Mediterranean, and an ambitious building program was initiated. This period of immense Egyptian power, which Tatmosa was the greatest ruler of, is called the New Kingdom period of Egyptian history. Akhenaten would benefit from succeeding to the throne as Egypt was in such a propitious position of power, but his reign would also stand as a period of turmoil within it. As the shadowy details of his birth would indicate, there is almost nothing known about Akhenaten's early life, but such is the interest in the reign of one of the most unusual and significant of ancient Egypt's rulers that many theories have emerged over the years. One holds that he was raised to a significant extent away from the royal capital at Memphis in the north, near where Cairo stands today. Here it is posited that he was a high priest of the god Ptah, the god of workers and industry in the Egyptian religious system. We know that his older brother, Prince Tatmosa, served as high priest of Ptah as well for several years before he headed south to begin training as his father's successor at Thebes. The suggestion is that Akhenaten succeeded him in that role afterwards, and it may have been this time in his youth as a high priest that imbued Akhenaten with strong religious sensibilities. Other theories concern his education, with several well-known scribes of the time being suggested as possible tutors of the prince. We can be certain that one of these, a man named Parenifer, did indeed tutor young Akhenaten in his childhood years as this Parenifer was later honoured with a major tomb, where an inscription notes his role in educating the pharaoh. Parenifer would also go on to become the senior most minister in Akhenaten's government in later years, and seems to have been a major influence on Akhenaten's life and reign. Some greater clarity is possible when it comes to Akhenaten's wives and children. Though there is still a lot that remains speculative even in this area, one thing is for sure, his great wife or chief wife was a woman by the name of Nefertiti. They were married at some stage in the 1350s, and so she and he were most likely wed when they were little more than teenagers. They may have been closely related, with some Egyptologists claiming that she was a first cousin of Akhenaten's or some other near relation within the Egyptian royal line. She was quite possibly a few years older than him. Nefertiti is one of the most famous royal women in the entirety of Egyptian history. This is based on multiple developments, the first being her position as chief wife to Akhenaten, who would become one of the most notorious of all ancient Egypt's pharaohs. Secondly, she is famous for a remarkable bust or statue of her head and neck that has survived over three millennia. This painted limestone bust was created around 1345 BC by a famous royal sculptor of the time by the name of Tatmosa. Discovered in 1912 during archaeological work at the city of Amarna, it presents one of the most vivid portraits of any Bronze Age woman to have come down to us. Finally, Nefertiti is well known for most likely being the mother of Tutankhamun, a pharaoh whose gold death mask, discovered by Howard Carter back in 1922, has become a defining symbol of ancient Egypt. Beyond this, she is also a good example of a royal consort who appears to have held a position of extensive political power in New Kingdom Egypt. Akhenaten had several other wives beyond Nefertiti. One was Kia, a name which is believed to have been a shortened version of Tadukipa. If so, she most likely was a princess of the Mitanni royal family, a people who ruled an area around Kurdistan today where the borders of Turkey, Syria, and Iraq meet. Accordingly, her marriage to Akhenaten would have been political to cement diplomatic relations between Egypt and a near neighbor. Other scholars of Akhenaten's reign argue that Kia and Tadukipa were two different wives. Kia was nevertheless most likely of foreign blood, as she is described in some inscriptions as being Akhenaten's favorite wife one who evidently could not rise to the position of great wife, as she, unlike Nefertiti, was not of Egyptian blood. Akhenaten also possibly married a daughter of the ruler of Babylon in Mesopotamia, though her name is unknown, while there is speculation that he was married to an unidentified sister of his. <laughs>
From amongst these marriages, Akhenaten had many children. His marriage to Nefertiti resulted in seven or more children, most of them daughters. There were numerous other children from his other unions, though the exact details of these cannot be reconstructed from the available evidence, and there would doubtlessly have been some who died in infancy as well, for which no record of their existence has survived. Akhenaten's earlier years were lived in the knowledge that his older brother, Prince Tatmosa, was their father's designated successor, and so he would succeed as pharaoh upon Amenhotep III's death. But Tatmosa died sometime in the early to mid-1350s. With this, Akhenaten became the new heir, and so from the mid-1350s, by which time he was most likely only just entering his teenage years, he began to co-rule with his father, an arrangement which was usually established to train in a successor in the key elements of government and the religious obligations of the pharaoh. There would also have been a growing awareness of the fact that Amenhotep perhaps did not have long left to live. Statues and other visible depictions of the pharaoh dating to the 1350s depict a ruler who looks to have been aged and sick, while DNA evidence from his mummy indicates he may have been suffering from obesity and arthritis, though he was still only in his 40s. Incidentally, contrary to some popular views that the Egyptians had very effective forms of dental care, Amenhotep was also suffering by the time Akhenaten became co-ruler from teeth that were plagued with cavities and which would have caused him serious pain. It was this obese, arthritic and pain-ridden figure who managed to rule down to around 1351 BC, though perhaps as late as 1349 BC. Upon his death, Akhenaten ascended as pharaoh in his own right, initially with the regal name Amenhotep IV, though he would soon change it to Akhenaten. The first years of Akhenaten's personal rule were distinct from what followed. The four or five years in question, down to 1346 BC, have been termed the Karnak years by some Egyptologists, to indicate that he was still continuing to rule in a regular fashion from the seat of government near the Temple of Karnak in the capital at Thebes, on the course of the River Nile in central Egypt. He was most likely crowned here, though possibly at Memphis, the ancient capital of the Old Kingdom. There are also inscriptions and other documentary and material evidence from the early 1340s which point towards Akhenaten continuing to worship multiple ancient Egyptian gods such as Ra, Amun, Ptah, Hathor and Nekbet, while textual inscriptions also refer to the gods in plural. He also continued to develop the city of Thebes, a metropolis which was at the heart of a rich and energetic kingdom. The Late Bronze Age was a period of immense vitality and wealth of a kind, which would not be seen again until the Greek culture of the 6th and 5th centuries BC. Thebes was at the very heart of this, a bustling city where industries like stone cutting, painting, glass making, pottery making and other crafts, as well as professional schools for scribes, medics and other skilled workers flourished. Furthermore, with a possible population of between 80 and 100,000 people, there is a chance Thebes was the largest city in the world at that time. Life here in the first few years of Akhenaten's reign would have appeared perfectly normal. Few could have predicted what a strange turn things were about to take. Another feature of these Karnak years was Akhenaten's completion of some of the building projects which his father had initiated during his long reign of some four decades. This focused on the mortuary site which Amenhotep had developed at Kom el Hetan, across the Nile River from the city of Thebes. The majority of the mortuary temple here has been destroyed over the centuries, but the layout of it can be reconstructed. It would have consisted of rows of pylons, indoor sanctums and outdoor sun courts, so that there was an interplay of light and dark along the walkways. This was a standard practice of ancient Egyptian religious buildings, and if rituals were held here at specific times of the day, the shafts of light penetrating through specific parts of the building would have made a deep impression on participants in rituals here, particularly where gold objects were used to refract the sun's rays in different ways. It all points to the way the sun was already central to the Egyptian religious system and provides a backdrop to the religious changes Akhenaten was about to undertake. 
Elsewhere in the building, two gigantic statues were erected. Known today as the Colossi of Memnon, these 60-foot-high stone monuments loomed over the western bank of the River Nile and could not have failed to impress people voyaging up and down the river on boats. The building work on the temple and the carving of the Colossi was also completed around 1350 BC, most likely just after Akhenaten had become pharaoh in his own right, and he would have overseen the rituals which no doubt accompanied the solemnizing of the new temple structure. The first years of Akhenaten's reign were normative in other respects. He continued to add to the great temple within the city precinct on the right bank of the Nile in Thebes. Here there is even an inscription depicting the new pharaoh making offerings to the god Ra, though elsewhere there was a subtle profusion of shrines and other religious spaces dedicated to the sun god Aten in the early 1340s. Elsewhere in Thebes, Akhenaten oversaw a said festival in the second or third year of his reign. This was in itself a rather peculiar move on his part. Said festivals were the ancient Egyptian equivalent of a royal jubilee. They were typically only held after 20 or 30 years of the same pharaoh being ruler of the kingdom and then every three or four years thereafter. In calling one within a few years of his accession, Akhenaten was indicating his willingness to break with tradition. His motive in doing so may have been a desire to establish continuity between his own reign and that of his father, and it is noted that the date of it may have fallen around the 40th anniversary of Amenhotep III's accession. If this is so, perhaps Akhenaten felt some vulnerability about having been a younger son and only emerging as the heir and then pharaoh in the course of the 1350s. The said festival may have been organized in an effort to proclaim the legitimacy of his reign and cement his status as the new pharaoh. While there were normative elements to Akhenaten's reign during its first years, it would soon take a dramatic turn that has created an infamous position for the pharaoh within the history of ancient Egypt. The shift came in 1346 BC, though for how long Akhenaten had been considering this new course or why he decided upon it at this time remains a mystery, with no clear answer. This all centered on the deity Aten, also spelt Atun, Atonu or Eden in various other references to him on temple inscriptions. The word itself derives from Old Kingdom Egyptian and refers effectively to a disc or sun disc. Therefore, in its earliest incarnation, the name Aten was used simply as a noun to refer to the spherical or disc-like appearance of the sun when viewed in the sky. Over time, the term Aten became one which was used to refer to a sun deity or god. Aten was just one such sun god. The most popular and important of these was Ra, one of the most important of all the Egyptian gods and goddesses, one who is said to travel through the sky in an arc every day, bringing light to the world. While in the evening he retired and night fell. Aten was just one of over a dozen deities which emerged around the worship of the sun, day and night in Egypt over the centuries. These practices of multiple forms of sun deity were reflected in a great many other ancient cultures of the Chalcolithic, Bronze and Iron Ages. What is unusual about Akhenaten's actions is the fact that Aten was still a relatively minor deity by the 14th century BC. Although there is evidence that the importance of the sun deities was growing in the Bronze Age world of the Eastern Mediterranean around this time, Akhenaten now went one major step further. For reasons which will remain elusive, he decided to proclaim the worship of Aten as a form of state religion. In this new religious system, the personification of the sun as a disc became central, stripped of many of the complex mythological elements which pertain to the worship of the sun through Ra and other more well-known sun gods. Although much of the material record of the worship of Aten was subsequently destroyed and wiped out by his successors, it is clear that temples were built or rededicated to the new god by Akhenaten and inscriptions were set up on altars and worshipping sites to the new deity. The pharaoh even changed his name. It is from around this time at the end of the 1350s BC that he began being referred to as Akhenaten or Eknaten, meaning something akin to effective of Aten 
or one who is dedicated to Aten. The latter decision was not entirely unusual. Egyptian rulers and nobles were often named after different deities. Ramesses, the name borne by many of Akhenaten's successors, includes the name of the sun god Ra. Tutmosa III, Akhenaten's great forebear of the 15th century BC, was named after Thoth, the god of wisdom and magic. The traditional nature of naming oneself after a god aside, the move towards active worship of just one deity was quite unusual for the time, one which effectively leaned towards a form of monotheism. Though, as we will see soon, there is a major debate amongst Egyptologists about the nature of the new religion. Before turning to the specifics of the new religion and how Akhenaten sought to expand it, it is worth trying to reconstruct the philosophical basis for it, a task which is made difficult by efforts to destroy the memory of Akhenaten's new religion by his successors. Firstly, the worship of Aten was perhaps derived in large part from outside influences. Whether from the Levant, the wider Middle East or further afield, there are Semitic aspects to it. In this sense, Akhenaten's decision to adopt it as the state religion points towards the growing prosperity and cosmopolitan nature of the late Bronze Age world, one in which ideas trafficked between cultures over hundreds of kilometers. Secondly, it was something of a more personal religion insofar as it involved a more direct communication between the individual worshipper and the sun deity, whereas Egyptian religion in the main used intermediaries, priests who received the offerings of lay people and then offered them to the gods for them. One of the reasons why Akhenaten's innovations were possibly so violently reacted against after his death was that he was alleged to have attacked the privileges of the powerful priestly classes. These were some of the core traits of the new religion, and we see inscriptions from the time and images which show people making offerings directly to Aten without priests and temple officials involved. There is, as we have already noted, a wide-ranging debate amongst Egyptologists and historians of Akhenaten's reign over how we should classify this new system. The traditional view, back when the details of what Akhenaten had attempted and as modern Egyptology developed as a discipline in the early and mid-20th century, was that it was effectively a form of monotheism. This is the idea that one god should be worshipped exclusively. Christianity, Islam and several other modern religious systems are monotheistic. By way of contrast, ancient Egypt and indeed most other ancient religious systems, such as those of Babylon, Greece and Rome, were all polytheistic. That is, they worshipped multiple gods or a pantheon of sometimes hundreds of gods and goddesses. While it is tempting to see the brief experiment in the worship of Aten as a form of monotheism, it seems more plausible to describe it as a form of monolatry. This is where the existence of a wide pantheon of deities is still accepted, but one is now placed in a position of singular importance. The idea here is that Akhenaten was not trying to disavow the existence of the other gods and goddesses, but that he was proclaiming to his people that Aten should be worshipped above all others. There was also a form of syncretism involved, the borrowing of other cultural practices and incorporation of them within one's own system. The belief is that Akhenaten proposed affording Aten a position of singular importance within Egyptian religious life, influenced by outside ideas from the Middle East and the Mediterranean world about the importance of sun deities. Some have argued that this cult of a powerful sun deity might have origins in the religious systems of the Semitic people of the Levant and Middle East, and that Akhenaten was influenced by ideas which entered Egypt from this region, as the New Kingdom expanded there during the reign of Thutmose III and his successors. One of the other core components of the new religion was to proselytize or spread it by acquiring large numbers of adherents. This is an issue which has concerned Egyptologists greatly, as they wonder if Akhenaten simply established a new cult and hoped it would acquire followers over time, or if he aggressively attacked the cults of other gods. The picture presented from the evidence of inscriptions and other material which has been recovered is complex. It is suggested that initially in the late 1350s and early 1340s BC, 
he began to introduce a new cult of Aten alongside other gods. But over time, this was expanded to favor the new cult of Aten when it came to royal patronage. Then, towards the end of the reign, there might have been a watershed moment at which he became much more aggressive and actually began trying to actively undermine the cults and temples of prominent deities like Ra, Bath, Amun, Thoth, Seth, Mut, and others. In particular, there was an active campaign of attacking worship of the god Amun, who had become, along with Ra, the most preeminent deity within the Egyptian pantheon by the 14th century BC, and who had an especially strong cult following in Thebes. As such, Akhenaten does seem to have actively tried to undermine the worship of other deities, but the degree to which he did so, and whether or not it was evenly distributed amongst all the other gods and goddesses, is a matter of debate. Another key aspect of Akhenaten's religious revolution was the establishment of a new capital dedicated to the worship of Aten. It isn't surprising to learn that ancient Egypt had different capitals at different times, when we consider the enormously long span of ancient Egyptian history, one which would eventually play out over more than three millennia. In its earliest days, the capital was located in Thinis, a city which we still don't even know the location of today. Around the 27th century BC, the capital was moved to Menefa, or Memphis. This was located on the banks of the River Nile, just south of the delta and within the southern suburbs of modern-day Cairo. Not long afterwards, the pharaohs began building up the Great Pyramids at the Giza Plateau not far away from this new capital. Memphis remained the center of power and governance down to the end of the Old Kingdom. The capital then moved around at various times, spending nearly three centuries during the Middle Kingdom period at Ichtawi, but increasingly became fixed during the New Kingdom period at Thebes, much further down the River Nile at the site of modern-day Luxor and near the Valley of the Kings. The reasons were twofold. On the one hand, a more southerly position allowed the pharaohs to govern their new territories to the south in Sudan or Nubia more effectively, while Thebes's position was solidified during the period when the north was ruled by the Hyksos. Thebes had become a flourishing economic, commercial and religious center by the time the north was recaptured and had remained the capital down to Akhenaten's time. He would briefly interrupt this primacy during his reign. Beginning around 1346 BC, Akhenaten initiated the construction of a new capital city a hundred kilometers north of Thebes, on the right or east bank of the River Nile. Today, we know the site as Amarna, though in ancient times it was called Akhetaten, meaning the horizon of the Aten, a name which indicates the choosing of the location as a place where the rising sun, coming east over Egypt, could be seen with great clarity. This was compounded by the fact that the city was centered on an acropolis, or hill, known to Egyptologists today as the Royal Wadi. The city was to be a dedicated governmental and religious center for the worship of Aten, and was to function as the seat of the royal court. This was largely a virgin or green field site which had little settlement on it prior to the beginning of the project, beyond a small village which might have been in the vicinity. Tens of thousands of laborers would have been deployed here in order to speed the construction work along, and large sections of the Egyptian economy must have been turned over to providing building material and other goods in order to erect a city out of nothing, a not inconsiderable project given the resources available to ancient states. The city which emerged in nearly complete form by 1341 BC, if the dedication inscriptions on some buildings here are accurate, was spread out along a 13-kilometer stretch of territory on the east bank of the River Nile. It was divided into a north and south city. The north city was centered on a royal palace and mortuary area, which were to be the heart of the government or administrative zone. The south city encompassed more the village of the workers who erected the buildings, and would doubtlessly have become a more residential area once the building had been constructed if the city had remained in use as a capital for longer than it ultimately did. To the east of this was the Acropolis and the tomb of Akhenaten, an elaborate mortuary building which it is assumed was intended for the pharaoh. Finally, between the north city and the workers' village in the center of the development 
there was the Great Temple of Artan. This elaborate temple complex of fine stones, statues, colonnaded arches and other religious edifices was to be the heart of the worship of Artan in Akhenaten's realms and was elaborately designed. Many reliefs and wall drawings have been recovered which point to an extensive and refined level of building work here in the 1340s, replete with hundreds of altars for worshippers to make offerings to the god. The building work at Armana and the art and architecture which began to emerge in Egypt more generally in the decade between the inception of the cult of Aten in 1346 BC and the end of Akhenaten's reign in the mid-1330s BC is very distinctive from other ancient Egyptian art. Indeed, so idiosyncratic is it that scholars talk of an Armana style during the reign of Akhenaten. Statues become markedly different, with people depicted with much thinner and more austere faces with an almost feminine edge. These are distinct from the fuller and more regal-looking faces of nearly all other pharaohs. There was also a tendency to depict the royal family in a much more intimate way, with Akhenaten and Nefertiti presented together on wall reliefs and in statuary objects. Similarly, the headdresses and clothing worn are somewhat distinctive. Nefertiti's headgear in the famous bust of her is indicative of this with Akhenaten's wife wearing a wig in a Nubian style. When it came to the temples and other religious spaces at Armana, a marked difference was seen in the open nature of these sites. The high imposing walls, punctuating sun courts, which were typical of ancient Egyptian religious buildings, were abandoned in favor of temples with small enclosure walls. The courts where the religious ceremonies were carried out and offerings made were now out in full view of the sun so that worshippers could be in the presence of Aten entirely when attending his great temple at Armana. Thus, Akhenaten's radical reforms extended beyond religion to how the royal government was depicted visually and presented itself to the people of Egypt. All of these decisions by Akhenaten have given rise to a major debate as to who he was on a personal level. This is almost impossible to determine when it comes to an ancient ruler. Kings and queens three and a half thousand years ago did not tend to write memoirs or anything of that kind that have survived and which might provide an insight into who they were as individuals. Instead, we are left to reconstruct this from other evidence. Some have argued Akhenaten was a visionary and religious radical. Others have argued he could have been insane or mentally unhinged in some fashion. There really is no way of knowing though. Another theory which has the benefit of being grounded on a vision of him as a political power broker was that he was fostering the cult of the sun deity as a means of aggrandizing himself. Courts in New Kingdom Egypt were no different to more modern courts and governments, with various factions and power groups some trying to undermine the ruler. Perhaps Akhenaten decided after years ruling from Thebes or Karnak to begin the worship of Aten and establish a new capital as a radical break from the old political system. The new religion would weaken the powerful priestly class and their followers and would centralize power in Akhenaten's hands, who in adopting his new name was intrinsically associating himself with the sun god. This view of him as a ruler trying to increase his own power by centralizing religious worship around him would also match with his decision to hold a said festival in Thebes not long after his accession a move which, as we have seen, points towards some insecurity in his position as pharaoh. Ultimately, we can't be sure, but there are many things which might have motivated Akhenaten on a personal level. While Egyptologists and commentators on Akhenaten's reign have, for obvious reasons, commentated primarily on the religious innovations he introduced, there were other things occurring in the 15 or so years between his adoption of Aten as the state god and his movement of the capital to Armana. Most of this centered on foreign policy matters. While Egypt had risen to a position of unprecedented power and prosperity in the Bronze Age world during the reigns of Tutmosa III and his successors, the kingdom did face opposition from various fronts. There were numerous other strong powers in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East. Generally, Egypt maintained good relations and extensive trading ties to the Greek powers, such as the Minoans of Crete 
and the Mycenaeans of the mainland, the latter of which had largely subjugated Crete after a devastating natural disaster around 1500 BC, but in the Middle East and Anatolia, it had rivals in the shape of the Hittite Empire and the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were based out of Mesopotamia, or what we term Iraq today, and around this time were undergoing a major resurgence in their power under their ruler Ashur Ubalit I. The Hittites were based out of Anatolia in modern-day Turkey and ruled southwards into the northern parts of Lebanon and Syria. During the Late Bronze Age, they were a perennial rival of Egypt's in this contested border zone. Beyond these, Akhenaten's government had to contend with raids out of the western deserts of Egypt and also the perennial possibility of the Nubians trying to free themselves from Egyptian domination down the River Nile into Sudan. We are fortunate when it comes to Akhenaten's foreign policy to have a major source of information of an unusual nature for a period in time three and a half millennia ago. These are known as the Amarna Letters. They are a series of 382 clay tablets which were discovered accidentally by some farmers in Amarna in the 1880s. They are unusual insofar as they are not written in Egyptian hieroglyphs, as one might expect but rather in cuneiform writing, the type of script which was favoured in the 3rd and 2nd millennia BC by people like the Sumerians, Babylonians and Assyrians, who were based out of Mesopotamia. The tablets nearly all date to Akhenaten's reign and record his diplomatic agreements with the Syrians and others and shed some light on his foreign policy. There are also numerous letters between the pharaoh and local rulers of parts of the Levant, some of whom were ostensibly vassal subjects of Akhenaten's in Canaan and other lands there in the mid-14th century BC. Interestingly, these vassal kings addressed Akhenaten as the Son, my Lord, perhaps indicating an awareness of the new solar religion Akhenaten was promoting at home, whereas the kings of Assyria and other large states addressed the pharaoh as a brother and equal. The Amarna letters and other evidence offer an interesting insight into Akhenaten's foreign policy in the Levant and wider Middle East. When it comes to the Assyrians, Akhenaten was primarily caught up in a diplomatic dispute between them and the Babylonians, a declining power that still controlled land in southern Mesopotamia towards the Gulf of Persia. Despite the fact that the Assyrians had long since emerged from underneath the control of the Babylonians and were now the dominant power in the region, the Babylonian king, Berna Burias II, wrote to Akhenaten on two occasions, inquiring as to why the Egyptian pharaoh was entertaining diplomatic envoys from Ashur Ubalit of Assyria. He would have received short shrift from Akhenaten, who presumably was negotiating an accord with the Assyrians against the Hittites. The latter, under their ruler Supiluliuma I, did make raids into the Hittite-Egyptian border zone in Syria and Lebanon during the 1340s, though there was little of significance achieved by these. This perennial border conflict between the Hittites and Egyptians would continue for decades to come, peaking in the reign of Ramesses II a century later, when one of the most significant engagements in ancient history, the Battle of Kadesh, was fought between the two. The Amarna letters are nevertheless a very useful window into how diplomacy worked here in the Bronze Age particularly on the nature of the vassal city-states and principalities in the border zone and how they communicated with the pharaohs in Egypt. A more significant military campaign was launched by Akhenaten to the south of his central kingdoms in Egypt. This occurred sometime in the middle of his reign, though the dating is not perfectly clear. Akhenaten did not lead the army himself, but dispatched his viceroy, the governor of much of Nubia, a man named Tatmosa, to head southwards and quell a revolt amongst the perennially unruly Nubians. It was not unusual for a pharaoh to command an underling to lead such a military campaign when it came to Nubia. In any event, Tatmosa treated the campaign as a routine military exercise, that such interventions largely were by that time, quickly bringing the unrest to an end. In the aftermath of it, several victory stele or stone pillars were set up in parts of Egypt to commemorate the victory.
Some Egyptologists have argued that there were other campaigns that Akhenaten might have engaged in, but all the evidence for these is very speculative. At the same time, we can probably dismiss the idea, which was favoured a century ago, that Akhenaten was some sort of pacifist. The reality is that Egypt was in a strong position in the Levant when he ascended the throne, and the Hittites made little effort to reclaim lands in Syria and Lebanon during his reign, beyond a few border incursions and skirmishes. In such an environment, the pharaoh judiciously negotiated closer diplomatic ties with the Assyrians, kept his vassal rulers in the Levant pacified and shored up Egyptian control over Nubia. This sensible foreign policy left him free to dedicate his time and the state's resources to his grand construction work and religious project in Amarna. In the end, Akhenaten's great enterprise was scuppered by ill health and mortality. In the twelfth year of his rule, that is around 1340 BC, not long after the initial phase of building work had been completed at Armana and the new city was opened, so to speak, a major festival was held there to celebrate Akhenaten's twelfth year on the throne. This saw emissaries and perhaps even some rulers arriving from neighbouring countries and also from the vassal principalities and cities in the Levant to pay homage to the pharaoh. This was quite possibly the source of the plague which struck Egypt in the early 1330s BC. A deadly plague or disease outbreak of some kind definitely occurred, and it may have been brought to the capital by these visiting dignitaries. Whatever the source of it was, the result was not good for the royal family. Several of Akhenaten's daughters were seemingly claimed by it, three of which, Meketaten, Nefer-Neferure and Setapenre, were daughters from his marriage to his great wife Nefertiti. Others still may have been impacted. One theory which has also emerged in recent years is that the plague was ravaging Egypt years earlier and that it may have actually been a cause of Akhenaten's religious reform program. The king having decided to embrace a new religion and god as the disease ravaged his country. This remains a hypothesis only, and there is little evidence to suggest the plague outbreak preceded the raising of the cult of Aten and the construction of Armana. What Akhenaten died from himself is not known. There is, of course, a possibility that the plague took him when he died at some stage between 1336 and 1334 BC. It could also be that he was suffering from a lifelong illness. Egyptologists have long noted that on statues and other monuments and walls, he was typically depicted as being a much leaner and gaunt figure than other pharaohs of the New Kingdom period. Maybe this was how he wanted to be depicted, but it could also indicate he was suffering from something like Marfan syndrome or Froelich syndrome. Both are complicated conditions which are related to the endocrine system and other parts of the body. They would also both result in a long drooping face and jawline such as the one Akhenaten was presented as having. At the same time, there are contradictions to any such diagnosis. Froelich syndrome, for instance, usually makes men sterile, and as we have seen, Akhenaten clearly did not have any problem having children. Given this, the more likely conclusion is that the unusual depiction of Akhenaten was wholly owing to his eccentric personality and the unusual art of the time, and not related to any illness of any kind. If this is the case, then his death in the mid-1330s BC, at a relatively young age, perhaps being little more than in his mid-30s, was quite possibly owing to the plague that was coursing through Egypt at the time. He was buried at the royal tomb he had built at Almana, though his mummy and sarcophagus were soon seemingly removed from there and perhaps taken to the Valley of the Kings near Thebes for internment next to his ancestors. The argument for Akhenaten having been ill for some time prior to his death is strengthened when we consider that there was a co-regency or co-rulership being developed in the last year or two of his life. The co-rulers were Nefertiti at one point and at another Smenkare. The identity of the latter individual is unclear. He may have been a brother of Akhenaten's or one of his sons of an unclear background. This is significant when it comes to the question of who succeeded Akhenaten. Having died a relatively young man 
his children were very young to succeed him in the main, and this Smencare, if he was a brother of the pharaoh, may have been chosen as a temporary successor due to being older. Yet the chronology is deeply confused and unclear, and Egyptologists debate whether Smenkari was dead himself before Akhenaten. What is clear is that Tutankhamun, the famous pharaoh whose gold death mask has become synonymous with ancient Egypt, succeeded around 1332 BC, just a short while after Akhenaten's death. He was a boy of no more than nine or ten years at the time and is understood to have been one of Akhenaten's sons, though his parentage is debated. Though suffering from a genetic illness himself, he would live and rule down to the late 1320s BC, long enough to leave his own mark on Egyptian history in overturning many of his father's reforms. While the period immediately following his reign and the exact changeover of rulers in the years that followed is imprecisely known, Egyptologists broadly agree on what happened during these years. Tutankhamun's reign saw a violent reaction against the unusual religious system Akhenaten had inaugurated. The worship of Aten was broadly abandoned, although the worship of sun deities of course remained central to the restored polytheistic system. The capital was also returned to Thebes. But things went much further still. A wave of iconoclasm ensued in which efforts were made to erase any memory of Akhenaten and the religious aberration he was perceived to have overseen. Armana was abandoned, its temples and grand buildings were literally dismantled and paved over. Though in doing so, the destroyers did a great job of preserving the city under the sand and it has been possible for archaeologists to retrieve much of it in recent decades. Inscriptions on public buildings, temples and monuments dating to his reign were erased, statues and tombs which had been erected were defaced, often with the physical features of statues chiselled off. Official records were also evidently destroyed. This amounted to a concerted effort to destroy any memory of Akhenaten and the cult of Aten. So comprehensive was this campaign that it destroyed many records of Akhenaten's life and reign and one of the reasons why we have such a limited knowledge of the circumstances of his early life and reign is owing to this effort to erase him from the historical record by his near successors. The campaign was quite effective. By the time of the long reign of Ramesses II in the following century, Egyptian society had largely forgotten the aberration Akhenaten had introduced. As successful as this campaign of destruction was, it did not stop the emergence of new forms of monotheism in the Near East in the centuries that followed. Judaism in its full form emerged in the Levant by the 11th century BC. Not long afterwards, the Persian philosopher Zoroaster or Zarathustra, as 19th century German philologists like Friedrich Nietzsche termed him, established Zoroastrianism as a new faith which was prominent in parts of what are now Iran and Iraq for centuries to come. The religious system of the Greeks was clearly polytheistic, but some local cults to deities like Apollo and Athena were so powerful that scholars argue they constituted a form of monolatry. The entire system rested on a belief in Zeus as an alleged king of the gods. Christianity emerged later out of Judaism, but incorporating significant elements of the Hellenic system, with many scholars arguing that the ideas of Zeus as a cloud god who ruled over the heavens, was a major influence on the early development of the Church of the Followers of Christ. Other quasi-monotheistic sun deities, such as Elagabal and Helios, became prominent under Roman rule in the 3rd century CE, before being overtaken by the rise of Christianity as the state religion of the late Roman Empire. Thus, by the time of the rise of Islam in the 7th century, Monotheism was the rule rather than the exception to the religious life of Europe, the Maghreb and the Middle East. Akhenaten, rather than being an aberration, was something of a prophet of the future shift from polytheism to monotheism. Eventually, despite the best efforts of his children and other descendants to excise him from the historical record, details of Akhenaten's reign and religious innovations began to re-emerge. This began with the realization by 18th century European Orientalists visiting Egypt that there was a lost city on the site of Armana. 
some remains of which were still visible above the sand. Archaeological excavations were undertaken there spasmodically in the 19th century, before the uncovering of the Armana letters in the 1880s led to a more sustained interest in the Armana site. Extensive studies were carried out here between the 1890s and the 1930s, and with this the story of what Akhenaten had attempted began to reveal itself after millennia of obscurity. In the process, Akhenaten has become one of the most studied of all ancient Egyptian pharaohs, as his rule was so unusual. There nevertheless remain unresolved issues surrounding it. For instance, in 1907, a tomb codenamed KV-55 in the Valley of the Kings, west of Thebes, was discovered and was soon identified as the tomb of Akhenaten. A mummy was located here and as recently as 2010, scientific studies began to appear suggesting the mummy was most likely that of Akhenaten. Other Egyptologists have derided these claims though, arguing that Akhenaten was buried at Armana and would hardly have been removed to the Valley of the Kings if he were considered such an abhorrent figure following his death. As with much else concerning his reign, there are more questions than answers, even after centuries of historical inquiry. Akhenaten is one of the most well-known of the Egyptian pharaohs today for one reason, his efforts to establish a new religious system in which the sun god Aten would have a position of primacy. This was not simply a personal religious preference on his part. The pharaoh was so dedicated to the god that he tried to establish him as the preeminent deity across Egypt, changed his name to acknowledge the worship of Aten and built a new city to honor the deity. This might not have been strict monotheism and should be described more as monolatry, where the other gods and goddesses were still acknowledged, but made peripheral by comparison with the paramount god. It still seemed like an aberration to Akhenaten's subjects, and after his reign, his successors did their level best to eradicate any record or memory of what he had done. Yet it would be wrong to see this as an indication of insanity in Akhenaten. He knew what he was doing and deployed vast state resources to try to make it happen. In the end, what we might suggest is that his establishment of the cult of Aten was indicative of the changing religious and intellectual world of the cosmopolitan Late Bronze Age, one in which outside Semitic influences concerning sun deities were influencing Egyptian culture. And in the end, he was ahead of his time. Over the centuries that followed, there were numerous monotheistic faiths which emerged in the Mediterranean world and that of the Middle East. Though it would take another two millennia for it to occur, eventually they would conquer all before them. What do you think of Akhenaten? Was he something of an aberration and perhaps insane as some of his contemporaries seemed to believe? Or was he simply a visionary who predicted the general drift from polytheism to monotheism in the ancient world? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.